Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now you have to make your comments. <laughs> two minutes. I don't know. You only have two minutes. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I want to say I don't think mere words can express the depth of gratitude I feel towards Trinity Western University okay. faculty, staff, administration have just been so wonderful. Back in 2013, I'm so grateful you accepted me into this program. I, I came to Trinity thirsty in my professional life and tired in my career, and it transformed me. I like to tell a story that uh, I share regularly about Professor Solberg asking my wife how, how I've changed since I undertook the MBA. And my wife Jessica responded, well, I make much better decisions now. I'm uh, better thinking, but most importantly, I'm a much better listener. And so it's changed me in a way that I, I really, uh, Words can't express the gratitude I feel. It's an it's a, it's a education that values the whole person, the ability and the freedom to, re, to have spiritual topics and faith topics integrated into uh, business education has been transformative on a level that really has been uh, amazing. I really value this education as the most valuable education I've ever received. So I want to encourage uh, this community I support this community, and I'm uh, deeply thankful for this honor. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm back at school carrying my books up. Good evening. My name is Judy Vankovich, alumni of the School of Business and of the School of Government, School of Political Science, they called it back then. And um, I too am filled as an alumni with that sense of gratitude, overwhelming gratitude for this place. And it's true in these serious days, we need to be thriving together. We need each other. And I would just love to see what other fellow alumni are here tonight. Would you stand, alumni? We'd love to see you. Just stand, one, two, three. Alumni stand and would like to applaud and see you. We need each other. Awesome. There you are. This is our, this is our night. Even our president is alumni. And also, if you're a student at Trinity Western, would you please stand? If you are here now, they were honoring those third and fourth year students, would you please stand? The Trinity Western, even if you're a freshman, stand. Sophomore, junior. So alumni, try and pick out one of these students and catch them before you leave and, and get their name and keep in touch. I was honored to be a mentor a few years ago, and I loved being a mentor, and I loved being mentored actually by RNT, who is one of our professors, RNT building over here. Well, I am Judy Vankovich now. When I was here, I was Judy Johnston, one of the four Johnston sisters who came here. And now I'm known better, probably, as Judy the Manners Lady, so please bid if you have children. Um, <laughs> the Manners Lady CD over there. And we were honored to be the new entrepreneur of the year for the Chamber of Commerce here in Langley. So that was exciting. But tonight, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker. Probably got asked because he's my brother-in-law. And I was so delighted when Ned, um, when Ned, when Tim married into our family. Ned is my husband, who's a professor in the school, of the film school here. And my son Zuri is a student here. My son Sammy will be here next year, and lots of nieces and nephews. But Tim, we are so glad to have you in our family. And you, I don't know quite if you knew what you were getting into when you married into the Johnston family, but there's Carolyn. Carolyn, we love you. And my sister Skye, my sister Janice is on staff and traveling today. But let me tell you a little bit about this guy, Tim, who married into our family. He's funny. He's fun to be with. My kids think he's one of the coolest uncles ever. And he leads a great worship on his guitar. And he's a hockey dad times three. Tim Sesnick. FCPA and CFP and founder of the Water Spray Group. And he's the guy who will help you win the tax saving game. He's become a household name and many of you read his articles in the Globe and Mail every Thursday. If there's usually a story he opens with, it's usually about one of our family members. Um, when the Canadian government brings down the budget, Tim's in there in lockdown, and then the Globe and, and he's, a few hours later, they release all the journalists, and he'll tell you what was in the budget. You'll see him on CBC, CTV, and Global. But I love Tim's books. I like the way he writes, because it's easy to understand. But I love winning the estate planning game, the tax freedom zone, 
and his team even put together Canadian taxes for dummies. There you go. My accountant's back here. Hi, Dave. <laughs> there you go. But um, it's been uh, an adventure having Tim and our family. But more than his generosity and sharing his time and expertise about finance and investing, and for whoever asked for it, Tim's an amazing guy. He loves the Lord, and he accepted Christ when he was in high school as his personal Lord and Savior. And what I love about Tim, he's not just a, a, a businessman who happens to be a Christian. He's been intentional in being a Christian businessman, living with integrity and choosing to serve God in the marketplace of life. He also understands the motto of our school, where Jesus Christ is Lord, nothing is secular. So Tim, I'm proud that you have come to my school to be our guest speaker tonight, that you and Carolyn have flown all the way in from Toronto for this business signature alumni evening. And now, as Tim comes to the podium, I'm going to tell you a little secret. It's Tim's birthday today. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand and join with me and give a warm Trinity Western birthday special welcome to our guest, Tim Sesnick. <laughs> sings happy birthday better than a bunch of Christians in a, a worship setting. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday dear Tim. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and I will say it's a, it's a special birthday because I'm 50 today. Woo! So, so I cannot think of something better than to do than this tonight. I'm, and I mean that. I'm actually glad to be here. Um, I've been traveling a lot. I've been traveling a lot the last few months, probably more than I ever have in the last 10 years, I would th I think. And sometimes when I travel, strange things happen. So I'm going to share with you a brief story of something that happened to me very recently. I was flying from Vancouver back to Toronto, and we were sitting on the tarmac for in Vancouver for what seemed like an hour. It was probably a little over an hour, when finally the pilot came on and said, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a technical problem with the plane, but we wanted to fix it before we got off the ground, which I can appreciate. So uh, they fixed the plane, and we, we finally got into the air. And uh, we were in the air for maybe, maybe 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. And this was uh, an older plane. Uh, we didn't all have our, our own television screens in front of us. It was, it's, you know, the, the, this one screen at the front was all there was, which was kind of odd. But they put the movie on about 20 minutes into the flight. And uh, um, I was watching the movie, I can't even remember what it was, for maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, um, when all of a sudden, the, the screen went blank. And so a couple minutes later, the flight attendant came on and said, you know, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a problem with the VCR, and, uh, which is strange again, I have a VCR somewhere in my basement in a box. <laughs> but anyway, you know what, they had a problem with it, so I said, you know, I'm just going to go to sleep. So I, I closed my eyes. I was uh, sleeping for, I don't know what it was, 45 minutes or an hour or something. When I woke up, I, I was awakened, actually, by a loud bang. So I opened my eyes, and there hanging in front of me was the oxygen mask. So the first thing I did was I, I screamed. And then um, I looked around, and I was the only one with an oxygen mask. So I put up my hand, and the, the flight attendant came running over, and I said, excuse me is the air here different than the air over there? And should I be putting this mask on? And she said, no, sir, I'm sorry, that shouldn't have happened. Let me fix that for you. So she took the, the mask and she put it back into the ceiling. She closed the little trap door. And, and then I turned to her, I said, you know, you're not giving me a whole lot of confidence we're actually gonna land in Toronto safely. You know, we've had a few technical problems with this plane. And she said, I, I apologize, sir. This, none of these things should have happened, but I just wanna reassure you, this will never happen again. I said, well, how do you know it'll never, it'll never happen again? She said, well, th this is the last flight for this plane. <laughs> so it's good to be with you tonight. It's good to be anywhere, but it's especially good to be here with you tonight. Um, by the way, I, I'm really pleased at the turnout. What a great turnout here. There must be, what, 150 people here. Um, not surprising, really, because all of my family live in Langley, and I think there might be three of you that are not related to me. Um, still, it's very nice to be here. When, when Amanda asked me to come and speak to you today, um, I thought, well, this is going to be easy. I'll show up and I'll give a little tax advice, maybe a little financial planning. We'll talk about some financial issues. No, that's not what they wanted me to talk about. So I said, well, what would you like me to talk about? Well, I'd like you to share your story. And I thought, well, that's not easy to do. 
So uh, I was excited by the opportunity and I'm glad here tonight to just share with you a little bit about my journey, um, my story, and some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, you know, I figured now that I'm 50, I, I'm probably old enough I can actually give some advice uh, to people about life lessons, so uh, that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. But I hope I won't put you to sleep because I'm going to talk a bit about my journey, a bit about my life story, and I'll do my best to skip the boring parts because there are a fair few of those in my life. But at any rate, I, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Oakville, Ontario. Grew up there uh, most of my life. I did not, did not grow up in a Christian home. Uh, my parents were, grew, up, grew up in Christian homes. So my grandparents uh, were very faithful people. They, they knew the Lord very well. It was my grandparents that had a very big impact on my life. And when, when I was younger, they sent me to, to camp. Um, in fact, that's where I uh, came to know the Lord was through summer camp. And that was because of my grandparents. But when I got back home from camp after the summers were over, I, I didn't attend church, not until I was old enough to drive and then decided one day, you know what, I remember giving my life to the Lord at, at camp. I'm just going to get up. I'm going to go to church. So uh, at about age 16, I started going to church uh, every week on my own, but uh, could drive there. Um, grew up in a, a middle upper class home, loved sports, you know, I played hockey every year, played baseball, loved golf, I used to teach guitar in university, make money on the side, so I always appreciate when there's a, a band around and I love to join in if I, if I can do that. Uh, I do have two younger sisters, um, and, uh, and also I'm the son of what I would call a true entrepreneur. Uh, I have to credit my father for really teaching me a lot of what I know about business. In fact, my grandmother, of all people, taught my father about entrepreneurship. She was amazing, and I won't get into her story, but uh, she was quite an amazing entrepreneur. My father uh, owned an advertising agency uh, when I was younger. He then went on to build a chain of restaurants. He built a business that distributed music videos back in the early 80s when music videos first came out. He owned a company that distributed those across the country. Uh, and then. You know, his last uh, uh, business venture, if you will, was a business that provided equipment to the film industry across Canada and a little bit in the, in the United States as well. And I uh, did very well through a lot of those businesses. But all of this terrified my mother. It terrified her because there were years where we had a lot. And then there were years where my dad would get this idea to start a new business and we'd have very little. So it was up and down, up and down, up and down. So when I was in my last year of high school, my mother came to me and, and they knew I wanted to go into business. Um, I had, um, uh, one thing my, my nieces and nephews, from many of whom are here tonight, might know about me is that uh, in high school I had a business of my own. Um, I was a disc jockey. Now, back in, now, I don't tell them that back in those days, being a disc jockey was not a cool thing. <laughs> today, it actually is a cool thing. Not as cool as it is, as it is today, anyway. But I had a business, and I wanted to go into business in university. My parents said, look, why don't you get your CPA designation, right? Do that at least, and so if you fail in business, at least you got that to fall back on. So I said, okay, that's good, good advice. And they knew me very well, so they knew that I would probably enjoy that kind of thing. So I did. I went and got my CPA designation. Um, I would love to say I went to Trinity Western University, and um, I feel like I've graduated from here. I, I feel like I've graduated vicariously through my, my family. Uh, my wife and her sisters have all graduated from here. Uh, my nieces and nephews are here. Uh, my kids, who knows, they're on their way to university shortly, but we'll see where they end up going, but it may very well be out here. So I feel like I'm part of the Trinity Western uh, family. But I did graduate from the University of Toronto. That's where I graduated from. And uh, at the age of 23, in 1989, I graduated from U of T and started work with Deloitte, the accounting from Deloitte in Mississauga, Ontario. It's nice to see Deloitte's uh, sponsoring our, our, our event here tonight. Um, and that gave me great exposure to a lot of different businesses. Um, and I, I loved owner-managed businesses because that's what my father did. All, uh, he was an owner-manager all his life, and, and I love those kind of businesses, so I, I focused in that area at, at Deloitte. I did specialize in tax when I was there, both expatriate tax or cross-border tax and just, um, just domestic tax as well. But in 1994, at the age of 28, I decided it was time to write a book. And uh, I wanted to write, and I always joke with David Chilton that I had the idea to write The Wealthy Barber before he did, um, which I, and I think I did actually, but he beat me to it. So I, I know David Chilton, we can talk and we laugh about that. Um, so he beat me, to the, beat me to the punch, but I decided I was still gonna write a book. And uh, I knew I couldn't do that working for a large accounting firm. The partners generally probably would frown upon that if I'm not, not a partner. So I decided to leave. And, uh, and I decided to write a book anyway. I went to a smaller local CPA firm close to home in Burlington, Ontario, a firm called Bateman McKay at the time, and I began writing my first book there. 
at that time, by the way, as a side note, I jotted down on a piece of paper 10 things that I wanted to accomplish in the next five years. And um, I thought, this is an important thing to do. I'm going to write these things down. I wrote these things down, all 10 things I wrote down on a piece of paper. And then uh, I proceeded to lose the piece of paper. So at any rate, and I forgot I'd even wrote, written those things down anyway. So it didn't even cross my mind again. Uh, but it's funny, I had actually internalized those things when I had written them down. Didn't realize that till later, as I'll share with you in just a couple of minutes here. But in, at age 30, in early, early 1996, I finished the book. And don't ask me why in the world I called, gave the book the name that it has, or it had at the time. It was called A Declaration of Taxpayer Rights. What a bad name for a book. That's a textbook name. Why did I, and the reason we did it was because at the accounting firm I was at, we self-published the book and the partners liked that title. So I said, sure, whatever. So we went, home, went along with it. And anyone here, by the way, have a copy of that book? Okay, Aunt Jean, all right, that's about it. That's about all. Um, no, even Aunt Jean doesn't have her cop anymore. I, I'll get you one again, Aunt Jean. <laughs> She's right over there. Okay, uh, you know what? I don't blame you for not having that book around. It was not, not a very, actually it was better than the title. The book I thought that was better than the title. It took me 600 hours to write the book. We self-published it. I called up chapters when, we, when the book was printed. And we printed 5,000 copies because you can't print 300 copies like you can today. You know, to make it economical per unit, you had to print 5,000. So I had 5,000 of these books stored in, I think it was uh, partly in a warehouse, partly in my basement. So I called up chapters and I said, um, I've got a book. Uh, can, I, can you sell it for me? And they said, um, you have one book? And I said, well, that's all I've written. They said, well, we're used to dealing with publishers that have you know, thousands of books. I said, well, can I, at least, can I at least send you one? So I said, sure, send me a book. So I sent them a copy of the book, and it was actually very nicely done. It was professionally designed and all of that. So a week later, I get a phone call from Chapters. They said, okay, we like your book. I said, great. I said, how many can I send you? They said, 50. <laughs> Uh, 50, I've got 5,000 of these things sitting in the warehouse. What am I going to do with 50 books? 50 books? And not only that, but they said, they sent me an order. Sent two over here, sent one to that store, sent three over here. So I, I sent 50 books to about 17 stores, all within a 15 minute drive of my home. That's all they would do. So I said, all right, why not? I just, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So I just sent the book to, to these bookstores. Well, a week and a half later, two weeks later, I started getting these faxes in. Uh, we want some more books. And they were coming not from head office at Chapters, but from the individual stores. So now it's in the book distribution business, <laughs> which I didn't plan on being. At any rate, um, that year, we sold 8,000 copies of the book. So it was a bestseller twice over. 